Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to Kidney Talk, everyone. Today we're going to be speaking about a very important topic. It's a topic that I have had to follow my entire life, and that is how sodium salt impacts my life. Everything is about salt and sodium when you have kidney disease. You have to understand it and know you know, what foods carry it and how it impacts your health. So today I'm excited we're speaking to Robin Russell. She's a Fresenius Medical Care lead dietitian out of Plano, Texas, and she's going to give us the skinny on salt. Hi, Lori. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, tell us a little bit. What is, there's sodium and then there's salt. So can you explain what the difference is if there is and and what is it actually? Well, that's an interesting question to start with. So a lot of times we use the two words interchangeably, just Mm -hmm. kind of loosely. But really salt refers to the thing that you see on the table because that's sodium chloride. Okay. And sodium could be in our foods, but it may not necessarily be sodium chloride. It could be something, a lot of us have heard of monosodium glutamate. Yeah, that MSG um, stuff that make, gives you a headache after you eat it. Yes. It that, gives me a headache. And, and then other <laughs> ingredients, too. So it's added to our foods as a preservative, um, mm-hmm. and that could be, um, you know, in different forms of sodium. So one form of sodium is table salt, but then there's many others that are we find in our foods. And then when you're reading the labels, it doesn't always say sodium. It can say that. I can't say that word, so I'll just say MSG. And I have to be yeah. very careful with MSG because it gives me a headache. And I think it gives a lot of people a headache, doesn't it? I don't know. Maybe maybe because it's sodium-based. Um, I do hear that a lot. I haven't personally experienced it, but I do hear that a lot. And it, just in general, it's loaded with a lot of, you know, it's another way that a lot of salt is hidden for our patients. Exactly. And, you know, whenever you go have Chinese food, I mean, it's it tastes so good, but it has so much sodium, unfortunately. Uh, so tell us a little bit about why it's so important for people who have kidney disease to, you know, be careful about their sodium intake. I would start with, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I gained too much fluid. Mm-hmm. And um, and then, you know, the nurse or the patient care technician or your doctor comes by and they'll say, well, you know, You really need to control that and cut back on how much you're drinking. They'll give you all these great ideas about how to control how much you're drinking. And some people say, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, the salt or the, or the fluid? Mm -hmm. And my thought is, is it, it's the salt first. Um, and that's what the nephrologist that I've always worked with in the clinic, what he's always stressed to me, it's the salt first. So the salt, how do I explain it? It's uh um, Well, I can explain it. It makes you feel like you need to suck on a hose outside. It makes you so thirsty yes. when you drink it. Like it's impossible. And I remember there is a, a doctor by the name of Dr. Belding Scribner, and he was the grandfather of dialysis. He created the first access mm-hmm. for dialysis and he always stressed exactly what you and your nephrologist stress is that Sodium, it's impossible to control your thirst if you don't control your sodium. So you are exactly. you are fighting a losing battle if you don't manage your sodium. You will be continually thirsty and it will be just continuous weight gains and um, and then your blood pressure is impacted by that and yada, yada, yada. And it's interesting because um, I had an opportunity in the mid-90s. To, I was working for a company, uh, uh, Critline. It's the product that Fresenius has now. But back yes. then, it was a, a small provide. It was a small little company, and I got to take the product to a, a companion animal hemodialysis unit. They were testing it out. It was a dogs doing dialysis, and it was a little oh. strange because I'm an animal lover, and I'm like, I don't think I would put my dogs on dialysis. But that's another show. But anyways, um, you know, they had the crit line on and I was watching these three dogs who were on dialysis and they didn't have much volume change and they didn't have much fluid loss. And they said, um, well, dogs don't gain too much fluid because we can totally control their diet. 
and we don't give them much sodium, so they don't want to drink. And then dogs aren't social drinkers, so they don't like go have a cup of coffee. So meet at Starbucks for. <laughs> and so it was interesting. Um, it really brought home what Dr. Scribner said: if you control your sodium, you will control your fluid because you have enough fluid on board. And if you don't need any more, you won't have the need to drink. So um, exactly. I think we we successfully made that point. <laughs> yeah, it. You know, something I usually like to use um, in the clinic um, is I would go to and check out what the serum sodium levels were running for mm-hmm. my patient. And the majority of the time, I would find that they were running normal. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes I would have a conversation with a patient and they would say, I'm sure I'm not consuming that much sodium. I really think that I just need to cut back on how much I'm drinking and everything will be okay. But when you see that the serum sodium is normal, as it is for most of our patients, you know that they're consuming a certain amount of salt and then they're drinking to match that. It it may be that they're consuming the perfect amount of sodium and they're drinking to match it, but it also could be somebody that's consuming a large amount of sodium and they're drinking to match that and that's when they're coming in super fluid overloaded. So the sodium doesn't really play a role. It doesn't really tell you how tell you how much sodium you've you've eaten. It doesn't go like high. Exactly. <laughs> it it's, doesn't go high. It's just telling you your balance between salt right. and water. What kind of sodium level do you think is good for a person on dialysis? Well, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I think it's 135 to 140. Something like that. Yeah, my sodium, I just got, I have a transplant, but it was 137. <laughs> and oh, I, I always watch my sodium levels. I'm like, I always know every single level that, and it's so exciting with a transplant. Everything's normal. <laughs> it's right. nice to be normal. And it is. It, it, well, I guess normal is only a setting on the dryer. That's what I've been constantly reminded about, that nobody's normal. We all have stuff. <laughs> I like that saying. That's cute. Uh, so um, how do people reduce their sodium intake? Um, what are some tips that you tell your your patients? Well, one, I guess, a surprising thing is I don't go for the salt shaker first. I might ask somebody to switch the, from the salt shaker to using a kosher salt and very carefully limiting it. But really, 5 to 10% of our sodium intake is coming from the salt shaker. The majority is coming from processed foods. Um, So on the simplest level, I would tell people to search for fresh foods that don't even come with a label. Like if you're in the produce section, there's nothing with a label there and nothing really has sodium except for celery. Um, So those fresh fruits and vegetables are all sodium-free choices. That's interesting why celery has sodium. Like, why is that? Is it that is. Because it it's was meant to be thing, a dip vegetable? They had to put salt in it? <laughs> it's meant to be a dip. <laughs> um, I think it's just maybe because it has so much um, water in the cells of the celery oh, okay. that, that maybe it has sodium there naturally. But it's not, it's not so high in, celery is not so high in sodium that you would want to avoid it as a food. Um, oh. It would be fine. Yeah, I love it. But it um, is interesting that it has it. Yeah, a little bit of sodium, um, celery, I guess, sodium celery. But you don't think of it as having a lot. And I remember um, my dad used to put salt on the celery. Like then take the celery and take the salt shaker and sprinkle the celery. Um, I guess it wasn't enough sodium for him. <laughs> It's that's, interesting, that's you know, funny. what people do with their, how they grow up and what they learn. But um, so yes. it's, yeah, you, you, you develop these habits and, and things that you're used to eating, to eating, and it's hard to change those. I grew up with, we never had a salt shaker on the table. So it was almost strange for me because I had kidney disease since I was two. I always had to eat a low sodium diet until I got transplanted. And currently right now, I need to eat a moderate amount of sodium to just keep my pressure at 110. So it's a total switch for me. Like uh, when I went and in to see the transplant doctor goes, well, I want your pressures above 110. And if they're not, you eat some chips. <laughs> and I'm like, really? A doctor told me to eat some chips. <laughs> and um, um, which I, he's my favorite doctor, by the way, <laughs> he told me mm-hmm. to eat 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, well, it's very that's scary. Interesting. To, yeah. It, it just it tells you that the reverse is true as well. That if if you want to raise your body volume, you can't do it without consuming salt. You can't drink your way to right. gaining fluid. Exactly. I mean, I have to eat salt to just keep the fluid on my body that's normal to keep. And and the whole logic behind that is he goes, I want enough fluid on you so your kidney's being perfused. I never want that kidney dried out at all. And so um, I had to learn the other side of it. And sometimes I feel it because I'm, uh, I'll eat a little sodium and I can feel, oh, just a little bit, you know, my, you know, rings getting off if I eat too much or something like that. Then it goes down in like just a short amount of time. But, uh, you know, everybody everybody feels sodium when they eat too much, even healthy people, right? <laughs> yes. Have you always gained it in your rings or noticed it in your hands the most? Or, you know, have you gained sodium in different spots in your body over the years? Well, I think I used to gain it in my ankles, um, just like everybody else when I was on dialysis. I think I recognize it in my rings more because I, I like to wear rings and I don't like them too loose. So that's where I notice it the most because if I want to take a ring off, I'm like, oh, I ate a little too much sodium. I need to pull it a little harder. Um, mm-hmm. So that's probably because it's such a small room of air when you have a ring on. Um, when you have shoes, though, I mean, and you're swelling, if you have a different size shoe before dialysis as opposed to after dialysis, you may want to rethink your food choices. <laughs> um, yes. And that's it. I mean, I like that perspective because I never would have thought of that as someone who hasn't been on dialysis. Um, that I, you know, you actually walk out with your shoes fitting differently. Oh, yeah, they fit differently. I mean, and and two, it's it's interesting how where people keep fluid. And I know you've seen this because if you're sitting a lot, it, the fluid can be. And if you're laying down, it won't be in your ankles. It'll be in your back. Yeah. And and, you know, fluid travels different places. It doesn't like you just stand up and it's like a waterfall and goes to your feet. Um, it, it takes a while to move around in your body. Hopefully, nobody will have to experience this, but you get too much fluid, then maybe you can explain you can go into congestive heart failure. And that's no fun. I've had that. <laughs> right. And with, without the working kidney, I think that that, I'm not a physician, but it seems like it would, you know, make it much easier to have that fluid back up and, and stretch the heart. Well, and I had congestive heart failure when I was 12. And it was it was pretty bad. Um, my mom and I were living in Florida, and I couldn't lay down and breathe at the same time. And they didn't quite understand what was wrong with me. I did have kidney disease, and I wasn't seeing the same doctors. So we actually, she decided to get me back to my doctors in California. And we drove across the country. She drove me across the country with my little black dog. And I could not lay oh. down and breathe at the same time. And I was in congestive heart failure for five days. And when I got here, it was back in the late 70s. So, you know, there weren't dialysis units and care everywhere. And we got to the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, and I was put on emergency dialysis. And I'll never forget that, because if you have any trouble laying down and breathing, (laughs) this might be a red flag. (laughs) That had to be a hard, what was that, a three-day job? It was a five-day drive. A five-day drive. And, oh, my gosh. And I was in complete, and then, um, you know, uh, 12 years old. Yeah, I'll never forget that. And my mom, I mean, you know, she was doing the best she can, um, but she she just was focused on getting me back home. She didn't want to get me to, like, an emergency room because I had really high blood pressure. And, you know, a lot of people didn't understand pediatrics with kidney disease. And, and a lot of them still don't today if you go to emergency room. They might have treated me differently than somebody who knows me as a pediatric nephrologist. So, um, yeah, I live to tell the tale, but I I do remember that feeling of um, just, uh, you know, I I couldn't lay down and breathe. So I slept against a window during the day when she drove me. And I'm looking back, I'm like, what was my mother thinking? (laughs) I have to say that, you know, like, what was she thinking where I couldn't lay down and sleep at night? But... 
um, obviously we made it. So, so Robin, one of the things that's interesting that happens during dialysis is, you know, you, you're you've gained a lot of fluid, and then because of the sodium intake, or you just, uh, and most likely it's from the sodium intake, because definitely um, if you're eating a lot of salt, like we said, it's impossible to stay away from um, fluid. But then you go on dialysis and you gain X amount of weight. And I've seen people gain five kilos. I'm sure you've seen it. And you can only Mm -hmm. take a certain amount of fluid off per hour. It's just not safe to take it all off if you've gained too much. But then you end up crashing because it's too aggressive a fluid removal for, for what your body can take. And then you give saline. And saline has sodium in it. And does that increase your thirst? Well, the, the sodium, the saline that you receive is balanced between salt and water already. Okay. However, I think what happens a lot of times is, I'm not sure that they're using as much as they used to, but they would do, they would increase the sodium in the dialysate to draw more fluids off more quickly when you came in heavy. Right. And that led to probably more of these crashes that you're talking about. And it also led to people leaving really thirsty. Um, but the bad thing about the administration of saline is just that you work so hard to sit there for, you know, how long to pull off a kilo or two kilos. And now here we are giving it back in, you know, 200 milliliters at a time. So it'd be very easy to, to receive a whole liter back. Right. Um, and then you go back the and you, yeah, it's a vicious cycle. Yes. Well, and, you know, what happens if you start crashing a lot on dialysis, you feel like dialysis is making you sick, but it's not actually the dialysis that's making you sick. It's the fluid gains that's making you sick. Would you agree with that? Yes. And and so that's an interesting thing about the symptoms of being too dry or the symptoms of being fluid over- overloaded. They cross over and they look the same a lot of times. So it's it makes it a little bit difficult to figure out where you're at. And I, I hear patients a lot of times will come in and say, you know, I'm cramping now or I'm getting nauseous. And they feel like that that's a sign that they are now dry or going below their dry weight. And they're asking that their dry weight be increased. And in some cases, if they were assessed, you find fluids and it, maybe the opposite's true. But we don't want anybody to hurt during the treatment. And so if that's the case, the answer may be to maybe run slower, but a little bit longer for a period of time, um, or maybe come back the next day um, and just kind of do some catch-up treatments. And at that point when you're caught up, hopefully they can start to challenge at small increments really slowly so that it doesn't hurt and yeah. get you too dry. Well, and it is because when you feel too dry, then you feel like, um, and what's interesting is I, 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 full disclosure here, I did work for the crit line in the nineties and I absolutely love that product. Uh, it's a non-invasive blood volume monitoring, Mm -hmm. um, a a piece of equipment that Fresenius now, um, owns and they're out there trying to spread the word about it, but it, it's a, it's always been amazing to me. I, I just still don't understand why it's not a standard of care. It just boggles my mind. But it's so we actually have a lot of it in yay. in North, North Texas. Yeah, <laughs> because it tells you your refilling rate of how you're responding to fluid removal. And it's um, when I had to go back on dialysis, it was wonderful because I could tell by my UF rate and looking at the change in blood volume what how fast I was pulling fluid out of my intravascular structure. And that gave me a sense of comfort because I've crashed before. And when I'd crashed before, it was usually because I had a steep drop in blood volume, not a gradual um, decrease in blood volume. So by watching that tool, it really benefited me to just feel a little better because you don't have any you don't have any warning when you're going to crash. That's what's kind of scary. You you just all of a sudden you're okay, and then all of a sudden you're not. 
And that's because your body does everything to keep you normal till it's like, oh, can't do it anymore. I'm going to start cramping. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clamp off the legs because there's not enough fluid in my intravascular volume, but there's fluid in your tissue still. It's just not, it's not uh, transferring over. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great tool. And I, I probably just say that's a commercial that I just gave to Critline. <laughs> But it's uh, great that you're using it. And have you found that it's helped you with um, educating people who are on dialysis? I do. I I can remember one case where a gentleman came in and he actually, to get to his dry weight, let's say he needed to take off six kilos. Mm -hmm. But he would always say, oh, no, 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 I can't do that much, you know, and would insist um, in only pulling off five kilos. So the dietitian and I that were working together were looking at the crit line monitor and we noticed that his trend line was just flat. Mm-hmm. So he was going to pull off five kilos that day, but it wasn't making any difference in, wow. um, in the, you know, the blood volume. Yeah. Not changing in his, his intravascular at all. Yes. And, um, you know, looking at everything, we went to the physician and asked, you know, and, and talked to the patient and explained to him what this, flatline means and um so you know it after seeing the evidence he was more agreeable to trying to you know add another kilo to the treatment um and it looked like he could safely do that because it was such a flat line well and it's interesting because people you know i'm constant constantly educating my peers that you know if you're in the hospital and you're not eating the same i mean you can lose real weight and fluid just takes that place and you're not the wiser uh, until Mm -hmm. you're symptomatic. And the same is true if you start eating more and feel better or uh, your dry weight can change to go up and down. So it can go both ways. I'm glad you brought up the hospital because that's what we see happen a lot of times is we don't really know what the right weight is when somebody comes back from the hospital. And sometimes you'll see, like, you're looking at the numbers and you're thinking, oh, my gosh, they're doing so good. They're not gaining as much fluid as they used to. Right. And we're just taking them back to the same dry weight over and over. But you see other symptoms adding into that. Um, And I always like to look at, well, you know, what does the patient tell me about their appetite and their eating and things like that? And a lot of times if you've been sick and in the hospital, you don't feel like eating as much. And so it's, you know, common that you would lose weight at that point. But it's like we're, the the reality of the weight loss has already happened. And us and our human brains are just back here going, oh, you lost weight. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, it, uh, um, I was in a hospital stay where I lost like 10 pounds over the course of a month. And it was, you know, you would never have noticed it, but it was uh, when I was on dialysis. That's a lot of weight to, um, you know, carry fluid in. Uh, so let's go a little bit back to salt. I kind of wavered over there because into the crit line yeah. because I, I do think that the more people who are on dialysis who understand it and uh, they can be more engaged in their treatment and understand how, you know, if you're on dialysis, like you said, a gentleman for, you know, the time for removing five liters and not even dipping into his intravascular volume. I mean, he's going to end up with left ventricle hypertrophy or, you know, mm-hmm. a, a heart attack. Um, so it's so important because fluid is really, you know, I think one of the biggest issues that people with kidney disease have to worry about um, for their overall Well, and can I mention one more thing? Is sure. I really think that it, I like to encourage people to look at the things on the dialysis machine and ask to look at them. Um, exactly. So, what is a sodium level? What is the temperature level? Yeah. <laughs> I know all those things. Yeah, and, you know, if if there's room in the lines to just turn your dialysis machine just 45 degrees towards you, ask, you know, so you can see what those screens are looking like and get used to, you know, asking them what are, what does that do? What does this do? Well, when I, you know, I talked to a lot of people about going on home dialysis, and I was on home dialysis. I did dialysis for 13 years, and 10 of those years I did home dialysis. So I can mm-hmm. I did one year of home hemo and nine years of PD. 
And, you know, sometimes it's a sad, and I can relate to it, but when you don't feel good, you just want somebody else to do your laundry. You don't even want to look at the machine. You don't want to look at the dryer. You don't want to look at anything. You want somebody mm-hmm. else to do your laundry. And inevitably, it's not folded right. It doesn't always um, come out of the dryer right. But when you get involved as a patient and you really understand what's going on and you're able to have more consistency through your care because you don't always have the same healthcare professional. But one thing that is consistent is, you know, you're at every treatment. <laughs> so you can help guide it and understand it. And and I have um, I think I've made a lot of my treatments better because I've had to have another treatment somewhere else. And I could say, hey, and know things about how the treatment affected me so I could participate in my care. And it made my care better. And I'm still here after 51 years with the illness. So uh, there's there's uh, that, too. <laughs> well, I love your um, your laundry analogy. <laughs> like, where <laughs> well, did it's you go true. with this? <laughs> like, like, I mean, you know, I mean. It is true, though. I mean, That's part of the reason why I don't have a maid. Um, well, it's, it's something, you know, it's something to be said for that when you don't feel well or, oh, I'll just let somebody else do it. And, and I certainly get that because sometimes you don't feel well or you think somebody's smarter than you. Nobody is smarter than you're about you than your own, than yourself about your own body. And, Mm -hmm. but it does get sometimes, I mean, I always use this analogy too, is that if you just bury your head under the covers then the monsters will never see, you don't have to deal with it. And if you don't look at the machine, it helps you kind of maybe forget that you're on dialysis. Like, you can pretend it's not there. Um, But, you know, that doesn't work long term, um, in my opinion. You need to be involved. Know your um, prescription. Know, uh, you know, know know as much as you can. Taking your blood pressure at home, yada, yada, yada. And which leads me to the next point of you need to know how to read labels. (laughs) When you go shopping. So yeah. maybe we can talk a little bit about how do you, uh, you know, how do you, uh, we talked a little bit at the beginning about a label, but anything with salt uh, that has significant salt other than celery, celery is an exception, is going to have a label on it. Yes. So well, with the labels, I would say the first thing you see is when you get to the sodium line, there's going to be two different numbers. There's the milligrams. And then there's the percentage. Okay. And I think a lot of times people are like, which one should I look at? Um, but a good rule of thumb, if you're just asking yourself, okay, is this food um, reasonable in the amount of sodium? Is you can um, compare the milligrams to the calories. And if the milligrams are higher than the calories, then you're getting into a higher sodium food. Um, that's easy. That's easy, yeah. Um, another thing you could consider is the if you wanted to look at the percent, um, the percent is based off of the USDA guidelines. So USDA is recommending that people take in 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. Mm-hmm. So if they put 10% on their label, that's a, equal to 230 milligrams. So... I'm giving out a lot of numbers. 10 is the only number that you'd have to remember. Um, so if it's 10% or less, then it's a reasonably low sodium food. Oh, okay, that's that's pretty easy. And do most labels, they have both though, right? They have both, right. So it doesn't really cover everything to have those little rules of thumb though. Because what if, what if you can't, um, you know, you don't feel like cooking for yourself and you're not going to make the greatest choice today, but you're going to get a frozen dinner. Well, there's there are better choices and there's, you know, not so great choices in the frozen dinner section. So if you look at your total day and say you're going to take three meals in, and we're recommending that you have 2,000 milligrams per day for most patients. So I would divide that by three and say 600 per each meal is reasonable and if you have one large meal a day then make that the meal that you have 800 milligrams okay that sounds like a a good way to slice it up Mm -hmm. so if i'm gonna you know shop for my frozen dinner then an 800 milligram frozen dinner would be the most the highest i could go 
Well, and I found when I was on dialysis, Weight Watchers has the best lower sodium meals. <laughs> just just an FYI out there. But any of the like dietary meals, they also try to limit sodium, I found, as opposed to, um, you know, Marie Callender's uh, chicken Alfredo. <laughs> Probably not what you're supposed to have. Yeah, that one's not great, yeah. (laughs) But um, I did find, like, they had some fish and rice and some different choices. And I'm a big lemon fan, so I always put lemon on everything, which is renal-friendly. And it helps quench your thirst, too. I mean, I I feel like it's satisfying, so you don't need so much water. And then there's all those different sodiums that are listed. What are some of the... um, disguise names of sodium that you might see on the label? Oh, in general, I would say even a disguise sodium should be included in that sodium. Oh, yeah, that's that true. We're getting too level. much in the weeds. You don't yeah, need to go read the so, labels. Yeah, don't get in the weeds. Just look at the, <laughs> bro- I remember will tell I listened you, in. Were you going to ask about potassium? Because a lot of times they are adding potassium to our foods and those are hidden. Yes, yeah, the potassium sodium. because they add phosphorus, they add all this stuff you don't need. That's why it's better to shop on the outer edges of the the store, right? Just go, yeah. just stay on the, don't go on the inside the of the food. aisles. Go stay on the outside aisles because once you go down a snack aisle, they actually know how to tempt you. Like I cannot live with unless I have that. I mean, it really, uh, they spend a lot of money on marketing. So it's better to just avoid those aisles. <laughs> yeah, I, I do skate through those parts, but I, I'm human too. <laughs> so. I know, I know, I know. They have, you know, they're always, they're always calling you because uh, sweet so, and savory. So like if we, um, like if we could take a, a quick tour through the grocery store, we've already known that the produce section is safe, right? Mm-hmm. And then it, you come to the meat section and um, if you have raw cuts of meat, those are certainly better choices than anything that they've seasoned. So any step along the way that they've done something for you, they kindly did it with salt for you. Right. So, like when they freeze it, they even add salt, right? Yes, exactly. So if they've done any steps for you, they've done that with salt pretty much. So that's the big thing to look out for with meats is, you know, trying to buy it as close to just a fresh cut of meat as possible um, rather than have they frozen it for you? Have they added seasoning for you? Um, is it pre-cooked? Is it pre-breaded? Any of those things are going to add sodium um, to just make it last longer, to make it juicier. And um, it has a purpose, but it's just not great for us. And I don't know if you ever suggest to your patients to make a food diary because that's the last thing I ever want to do in my life is make a food diary. But I'm it, with you. I don't like them either. But it is good to be aware of what you're eating and understanding what makes you thirsty. So, yeah. um, I mean, yeah, because I've had people, oh, can you just make a food diet? Well, yeah, let me just shoot myself, too. I want to write down all the things I didn't want to eat. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, but I usually <laughs> ask people just to tell me what you ate yesterday. Yeah, yeah, like, I mean, it's good to jot it down and and understand uh, if, you, if you're not familiar. I mean, I think a food diary is good for, especially like if a family member is trying to help out. Uh, somebody is to really write down what they're eating so that they can express to the dietitians what we're eating. But I think, mm-hmm. um, I think for me, and what you're saying is so much more practical. You need to know the basics of food and understand them, and then make choices for your for your menu, as opposed to eating all this different stuff. And they're saying, "Well, you're having a high sodium." salad dressing you're having you know frozen turkey which you could have fresh turkey all the different things and when they don't give you that detail that it was frozen they just say i had turkey and and lunch meat is like the worst like it's better to get like fresh sliced turkey from the deli and they have they have some that's low sodium uh, because i actually buy that one i like that one better than any other type of um deli meat i still buy the low sodium turkey which is Usually an option mm-hmm. in most delis. It is. Um, and well, they do make some natural um, lunch meats now that won't have added phosphorus, but they're still going to have maybe 400 milligrams of sodium in them. Um, 
So I think that those are some good options too because they're, you know, not quite as expensive as the deli. Right. Um, typically though, it's kind of shocking to me when you look at, I mean, how many slices of lunch meat do we put on our sandwich? Maybe three. And that's only about maybe six to nine grams of protein. Um, so I'm always trying to look for other ways to get in more protein as well. Right. Um, so. So many I things like to tuna. manage. <laughs> I don't, if you like tuna, tuna is a great thing um, because it's easy and you just open up, especially if you can catch the um, the new foil packs on sale rather than the can. You don't even right. have to get out a can opener. I like tuna. I like turkey. I like, um, yeah, I mean, ham, no. Don't go after the ham. That's not a good idea. I haven't seen a low sodium ham. <laughs> <laughs> I said don't even go sure. for it. Don't even try it. Don't even don't even attempt to go for a ham sandwich if you're trying to control your so- sodium. Um, yes. And, and maybe we can ramp up because this is a lot to talk about. But what about salt substitutes? Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let you answer. It. Yeah. Well, so salt substitutes are traditionally. Like brand names like No Salt or New Salt, mm-hmm. what they do is they give you that salty flavor, but instead of putting sodium chloride, they put potassium chloride. And right now, it's so um, there's a lot of public information out there about reducing sodium in the diets. So the food companies have caught on, and they're remaking a lot of the foods with lower sodium, with the trick of they're actually replacing the salt with potassium chloride in the packaged foods. Them evil knievels. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, we're waiting still for potassium to be added to our food label where we can actually see the milligrams. You mean the phosphorus or the potassium? Phosphorus. The pota- Well, I would love phosphorus, but it's to- only potassium right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they need to add phosphorus because they're adding it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so they are. Is there anything different between Himalayan salt and regular salt? I mean, they're all these well, making all these yeah. different choices of salt now. But I, I just say stay away from the salt. But the, uh, like if you say Himalayan salt or sea salt or kosher salt, the big difference for all of those and then table salt is really the grain size. Oh, them being sneaky. and so a lot of times you'll read things that'll say, oh, well. Sea salt or Himalayan salt or kosher salt is lower in sodium. But the truth is it's lower than sodium because the bigger grains, I mean, you can only put a few big rocks in the same space as, you know, if you had gravel. So the table salt is more like gravel and you can get a lot of gravel in the same space versus there's going to be holes in between big rocks. And that's what the the sea salt is. That's all it is. It's just marketing different sizes of salt. So you could get the big salt. If you weighed, by weight, they're the exact same. (laughs) But by volume, they are less. And so it does make you measure a little bit less out if you're using kosher salt. The other benefit that I see to those is that they, um, the bigger grains, your tongue knows it when, when you taste it. And so you tend to not need as much of it to get the same salty flavor that you were looking for. Well, and I mean, you know, it is. It's now you have all the cooking shows on and they talk all about all these different salts. Uh, So maybe we can Mm -hmm. wrap up with what kind of herbs do you think are best to help with flavor? And, uh, you know, I love Mrs. Dash. I'm going to throw that out there right now. I use Mrs. Dash a lot. Uh, that's a great option for people. Uh, but uh, any tricks you have? Well, I really like garlic. I think that it, garlic powder has a little bit of that salty um, flavor that we enjoy. Um, definitely, if you're going to do like garlic powder, onion powder, be careful not to get the ones that say salt. I would oh. steer clear of most of the um, mixed blends other than Mrs. Dash. Um, there are a few other brands out there that do make nice blends that don't have added salt, but you really need to read those labels carefully when, you know, buying blends other than Mrs. Dash. The other thing is I find all the time, 
some people are turned off by Mrs. Dash, and the way that they were introduced to it was as a little packet on the side of their eggs at the hospital. Have you had that? Oh, I have. It's nothing like eggs at the hospital. You lost me at eggs at the hospital. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It, it, it's, that's gross. It's gross. I never <laughs> order it. I never have. I have one hospital that lets you order food, and then another hospital I go to, they bring you food. And, mm-hmm. yeah, eggs is not high on the list. So I, I would agree with that. And your taste buds are off when you're in the hospital. Exactly. So, and so it's really intended to cook like an herb. And so you need to put it on the raw food and cook it, you know, right. through the whole process. And then it takes on a whole other flavor. But I think a lot of people are introduced to it as a salt substitute, as if you would sprinkle raw herbs on your finished food. And that's not the way we normally do things at at home, and it, it just, it's a poor way to introduce Mrs. Dash to people, I feel like. Well, and there, if you go to the aisle with all the seasoning, I mean, they have like 20 flavors. And I love the lemon one. There's a lemon one, lemon, mm-hmm. that I absolutely love. So, uh, you know, the I trick is... I think they make dinner so much quicker. They do, and it's, you know, it's a lifestyle change, but I I always remember that, you know, we have food to eat. That's 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 the benefit over half the world. So, um, and just you know, trying to recenter yourself, and and it's really important to you know watch your sodium so you can, you know, stay healthy with your fluid gains and live the life you were meant to live. So, uh, I thank you so much, um, Robin, for sharing all of your practical advice. And you know, I think I would really like you as a dietitian because. You practice what you preach, I think, because I've had people like, you do a food diary. I'm like, oh, yeah, you don't do what I know that. <laughs> so, no, I don't like food diary. I will write things down for several days to see what I'm doing. Right. Like something that's reasonable. I get part of it. Exactly. But, um, well, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and, uh, you know, for Cineas Medical Care, uh, you know, thank you for uh, letting us interview your dietitian and learn what about sodium and hopefully... We all need to limit our sodium because I forgot. I forgot this one point. When you have too much fluid on, it raises your blood pressure, everybody. So um, a lot of blood pressure issues are related to too much fluid. So I forgot and to say that. When you, when we use the Critline machine really well, we find that blood pressure is controlled. Exactly. It's with fewer so, medications. Well, and what's interesting, I will say when I got my transplant, and then when I went on peritoneal dialysis, I always had blood pressure problems on hemodialysis. And when I went on peritoneal or got transplanted, my blood pressure hit the floor. It was like 110 over 70. So PD really managed my fluid well. I could drink more, and I could take it off regularly because we were doing the treatment daily, but it really showed me that all of my incidents with blood pressure was related to fluid. And I don't take any blood pressure medicine at all. And I didn't take any blood pressure medicine when I was on peritoneal. But on hemo, sometimes I needed it. And and so people need to really understand how that impacts your treatment. So, uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Robin. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. Okay. Thank you so much, Lori. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.